first of a series of online meetings and events that we're organizing with Placemaking Europe. At the end of this webinar, we will let you know which are the next moments to put them in your agenda. And maybe now we can do the rest of the four polls. Nas, can you broadcast them, please? Perfect. So you have also 20 seconds for that. Three, two, one. Thank you, Naz. And let's see if we can broadcast the results now. I'm sharing the poll results now, uh, but in case just if it's not seen. Um, so most of our participants think that um, one of the main mechanisms waking, working against the creation of great places is that developers may have short-term orientation. Um, and use standardized materials. And then the second is that municipalities may not have the proper regulations, or it may simply be uh, no one's task to create um, great places. And mm -hmm. then um, our uh, participants think, think that it's because of the, and they might not be speaking the language of the real estate or forgetting about the finance. And the least of our participants think that uh, designers may not be educated in and aware of this situation. So All right. All right. I'm launching the next poll now. Yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Three, two, one. If you can close it, please, Nas. Yeah, uh, th there were just dynamic answers coming, so I just gave it a couple of seconds more. Uh, so um, one of the um, most challenging phases, according to our participants, is the management uh, of the area development. Um, the least challenging is the develop, uh, design, apparently, and then the development. And um, in between those, we have the concept and planning. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now we can move forward. Ah, uh, yeah. OK. Now we can see it indeed. Perfect. Can you launch maybe the next one as well? Zoom is a whole new world. This is the last one that we're okay. having. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it could be that a friend told you about a colleague. <laughs> Three, two, one. Close it. Yeah, you can see most of our participants are coming from the Place Making Europe Facebook group, uh, but we also have participants coming from the Vienna Place City team, Oslo Place City team, mm -hmm. and other Place Making networks as well, and from Steve. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Naz. Thank you. Naz is our magician today with, for, for the Zoom technicality. So if something doesn't go well and you hear me screaming, Naz, that this is why. Thank you, Naz, very much. And I would like to ask uh, Hans Karsenberg from Stipo to introduce us a little bit to what the theme, what the topic of today is. Yeah, uh, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is an exciting experiment and uh, very exciting to be a part of this. Um, we want to talk about uh, placemaking in area development or place-led development as it is also called um, because we see that uh, very often in new developments uh, placemaking is maybe there in the beginning of the process or sometimes at the end of uh, planning everything somebody in the project team wakes up and says well, we, we wanted the area to be vibrant and let's do some placemaking 
And very often we find that uh, you can do great stuff in the beginning and at the end of the process, but actually you want the entire development process to be more about creating human skill, creating great places, creating good public space, helping to bring social life to these areas and uh, to think really from the integrated point of view of that. Um, so place-led development or placemaking in area development is trying to take all those lessons from placemaking and, and bring them to the entire uh, process of development so that we get to better new developments in our cities. Our cities are growing very fast and unfortunately we're still seeing a lot of uh, quite unfortunate developments uh, nowadays and we have a mission to not only create great places but also to create great areas of course. So I would leave it at that for now, because I think first we will go to uh, uh, make a round in Europe uh, uh, along some of our frustrations and some of our inspirations as well. Exactly. We have invited some of our um, members of, of our network to share with us uh, one bad example and one good example from around Europe to get rid of our frustrations. So I would like to invite, uh, first of all, Peter Peter Pere from Stockholm to share with us his examples. Peter, uh, Bertel, you have two minutes, one minute for each picture. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Yes, uh, it's the bad example that I'm, I'm beginning here with. And ventilating my frustration is exactly what I would like to do with this. This is from my hometown, which is in Tallinn, Estonia. So this is a waterfront uh, to, to the right and to, to, uh, to the back of the, the camera is the old town. So this is at the very heart of the center. And while this is a rendered uh, photo, it is already built. Uh, so a new road by the seaside. And while it may look nice, as all rendered photos look like, there was a massive protest against this road. So this is called the Reidi Road as opposed to it being called Rady Street. So on the right hand side, you see a two plus two or a three plus two motorway, uh, which is meant for trucks mainly driving to and from the harbor. And there was a massive protest against this from architects, landscape architects, urbanists, um, professors, uh, etc., that build the street, the part meant for cars, make it narrower make it into a street as opposed to into a road, a transit corridor. So the sort of classical example perhaps, but this just happened in my uh, hometown and despite all and every protest, nothing really happened. Uh, the city said, yes, we'll make it narrower and uh, we'll build what you can see here. This was built, playground, uh, several playgrounds were built and it is as close to the seaside as you can see and there's a, um, a uh, bicycle path leading all the way uh, to and from the the beginning and the end. However, nobody goes there because there's no point of going there, simply. Uh, so it was, uh, it's a very bad example and I'm glad to tell you more. However, there are more inspiring examples. This is Gothenburg Freehamnen, so a part of an, an old industrial harbour area and Gothenburg at uh, Western Sweden will be celebrating its 400th anniversary in 2021. Lots of things are going on here in the cold and dark uh, Nordic climate. As you can see, an outdoor pool has been done here so people can enjoy more of the waterfront. So there's a massive urban regeneration going on there, but they are already beginning with prototyping. So they have been involving uh, uh, students and young people and, and citizens uh, uh, massively to do prototypes like the the pool here a sauna and other activities temporary and, and less temporary and those that work like the sauna like the pool they will make uh, permanent and include in the uh, long-term park uh, that is uh, will be built there in in Gothenburg uh, so that's an inspiring example Thank you very much. You already started pinpointing some very interesting aspects of how the process goes. Uh, thank you, Peter. And maybe uh, then we have Peter Williams from London to share his examples. Peter, you have two, uh, Peter, you have two minutes. Hi, thank you very much. Um, this is quite a strange one. This is a, a built form, as you can see. This is a two-bedroom apartment. And uh, it wasn't a very typical 
uh, part of the London residential scene until fairly recently, but it has boomed. Uh, it's been the economic driver of much of the development throughout the city, um, to the west and to the east in particular. Um, at one stage uh, a year ago, there were 54,000 two-bedroom units with uh, planning consent or in the planning pipeline. Um, and given that sales of two-bedroom apartments was around about 5,000 a year, there was potentially 11 years supply of this uh, kind of unit. So the seeds of its own destruction were, were planted. A complete disregard for um, how the buildings, these, these uh, high-rise or mid-rise buildings met the ground. Um, and other implications around the homogeneity of the people who occupied there. They weren't attractive to, farm, uh, to families. They were uh, okay for young professionals. They were quite expensive, as you can imagine. So with families not being attracted, the economic driver worked in reverse because the economic and social underpinning for community was absent because the, the, the people who use those facilities were largely absent. So instead of being the economic driver, as I said, it, it was um, inevitable that the economy based on these collapsed and um, there have been a real um, uh, constraint and anchor on, on place-led development. So more, more happily, um, this is another example from, from London. It's um, called a low line, borrowing a little from a more famous example, perhaps in New York, uh, called the high line. But this is uh, at ground level. It's a way leave two and a half meters wide that goes along this viaduct from two mainline stations two and a half miles apart. Um, it's not used at all currently, or hadn't been used at all, other than for uh, deliveries to the arches that uh, holds the railway up. And it was populated by bins, and you can imagine uh, some illegal parking and all those kind of things. So we announced um, the low line probably oh, three or four years ago, and instead of having um, this impediment to social and economic mobility by these rather foreboding Victorian uh, arches and infrastructure, we are turning this uh, impediment into an asset. So we're using the infrastructure creatively. We're using it to generate new jobs and recreational opportunities. The uh, way live itself is becoming an ecological artery where we're looking to uh, promote biodiversity right into the into the heart of the of the city. And although it's all owned by a private landlord who bought it all from the state, a massive one billion pound transaction, um, which has got implications for us, obviously, because it's, uh, we're learning to live with a, with a different, different owner. But we're trying to create that space so there's diversity along the whole length. We're trying to manage it through what we call a green facilities management program. Um, and uh, we are actually taking some units ourselves to um, to prove how mixed mixed uh, use can can operate along the length. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not a it's not a social place as as a concept, I suppose. And um, one of the arguments we're having is how we can use it as a kind of kite mark or a um, a standard for 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 of, of quality for this brand to go along the whole viaduct throughout the city. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, now I would like to invite Roland Krebs, who's from Vienna. Roland? Hello, everybody. Yes, <laughs> yes hi from Vienna. Uh, bad example. Uh, well, I just want to start with uh, area development in Vienna is quite uh, a, a big business. Uh, so uh, we are having a lot of uh, big urban development uh, areas, uh, and one of them is Seestadt Aspen. It's a very big uh, site, uh, it's 200 hectares. It's like a satellite city, and uh, it's, it will be made for 60,000 uh, inhabitants, so that's a small city or a bigger city in Austria. And uh, the bad example comes from this site. Uh, because I was there and I was um, puzzled because 
I was walking there and there's a big new uh, square and uh, and I, I thought, hey, there's a place making going on and I just have a look and then I was uh, thinking, well, they have the same color everywhere. So that looks like a corporate place making. And it turns out that this is from a bricolage uh, shop uh, from, from Austria, the biggest one, it's called Obi. And they have one big place making intervention, it's called Mach mit. And, um, well, I'm not against that they do business and, and, and everything, but I think it's a little bit uh, difficult that uh, a private company gets a lot of uh, free space um, to, to, uh, to uh, promote their work there. So um, uh, we are not, so I, I think I'm not really uh, in favor with that. A good example is, uh, and it's just uh, a few hundred meters from this, uh, from this area development, there is another site it's called Beresgasse, and uh, it will be home for maybe 5,000 people. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a pro it's, a, it's a project under the zoning right now, and it, uh, zoning will be, will be done very soon, and they will start uh, building all these buildings. And uh, they made a, uh, a place-making intervention uh, with a bus. So they took one of the old uh, Viennese buses. Well, it's not so old, but they took a, like an older bus. And uh, they will use it as a, as a placemaking tool to activate and promote these new spaces that people can, can go there and see their new homes uh, and also start uh, living there, like experiencing uh, this area. And I, I think it's a quite positive example because you can move this bus um, to other sites as well. So you're not uh, uh, place-based in the sense of uh, you have just one thing uh, and one, one, um, one location, but you can move it to other places as well. So I think that's a good example for me. Roland, can you repeat maybe the name of the title of this project, the last one, before we move to Nadine? Uh, ich brauche Platz. I need space. Okay. Thank you very much for, for taking us to Vienna. And now let's go to Rotterdam with Nadine Rose. Nadine, what is your transition from bad to good in your case? Thank you. Hi, Vivian. And uh, first, let me start by thanking you for this great invitation. It's lots of fun also. I like the other uh, presentations. Um, but we uh, tried to do something different. And um, we wanted to show you um, a couple of drawings of how we view cities, the worst examples and the, 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 the good examples and the great city, what a great city should be like. So um, what you see now is like the worst possible um, city. So cars have all the space, um, there's uh, no uh, place for pedestrians, um, there's only, only one thing here you can feel intimidated by um, the cars and the uh, Architecture and architecture is very monotone. It's huge building blocks that don't uh, connect. So what you often see is that the next step in, step in improving um, cities is to add green, like these trees, and to make room for um, cycling. So there's an extra cycling lane. But this is like the first, first step. And it's not lively yet. And then you see that placemaking is um, often um, invited to the city to create um, uh, a liveliness, but it's often like a box of tricks that um, is like an instant moment of uh, fun in a city and not something that contributes to the city on a, a long term. So, um, yeah, the next slide shows um, even uh, more improvements. So um, um, the cities get a, a lively plint. So there's more activity. The pavement is lively, there's room for terraces and cafes, and um, yeah, people can uh, own their city. Um, but still, um, architecture is, was lacking, so um, you can improve the architecture uh, by um, um, creating connection to the street so that the buildings open up towards the street. But still, you see like huge monotone blocks, and it's not, um, there's still potential in this uh, city. As you can see by adding green to the roofs. But still, this city is not perfect yet. Um, 
we think that the architecture, uh, architecture in the city should be um, uh, differentiated, not so monotone. There should be room for the eye catcher, but also for different functions or just fun and beautiful uh, buildings and beautiful architecture. So if you all take these things in the mix, then we believe we have the perfect city. And then this is uh, how you have uh, like the, the place-led development. Thank you very much, Nadine, and thank you very much all of you. I think we have already started highlighting some aspects that might have to do with the temporary, with the permanent, privatization, right to the city, the citizens. So these are all discourses that are within placemaking uh, very active. And it's also interesting to see how they relate to place-led development. So thank you very much, all of you. And I would like now to invite uh, Hans Karsebeck from STIPO to introduce us to the main topic of this webinar, which is place-led development, or as we're going to say it now, placemaking in area development. Hans, the mic is yours. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> Uh, so it's been great to do this round, uh, guys. Thank you very much for that. Um, we always like to use these uh, sessions for our own uh, personal therapy, uh, getting rid of our frustrations uh, in, a, in a nice way, and also sharing the inspiration, of course. Uh, for us, this has been a theme that we've been working on uh, with uh, STIPO. Uh, I'm a, one of the partners of uh, STIPO, a team for urban development uh, based in the Netherlands and uh, also one of the initiators, co-initiators of uh, the, the network Placemaking Europe. Uh, but we've very much been having these conversations um, in Europe as well, in Placemaking Europe. In Valencia last year, we had a great couple of sessions on place-led development and on place management. And we no also noticed how they overlap. Uh, and uh, in the leader meeting, we took a next step. So we've been building the story very much on, on that input. But also in the rest of the world, um, I know there's people listening in from Halifax, for instance, Canada, and from Singapore. And also in, in uh, those uh, places, we've been discussing very much, uh, there shouldn't be this distinction between fun placemaking on the one hand, and then more or less the real serious city making on the other hand. You want those two to be uh, interwoven uh, more. Now, of course, we are in a corona crisis at the moment. And um, it may seem funny to talk about new development in cities. Um, although we do see in our own projects that uh, a lot of the ongoing area development wants to continue going on and they will prepare their plans because they are thinking in the long term and are thinking past the current crisis very much. So development is still happening very much. It might be a reali reality that a lot of the area development or new development in cities is going to be in the fridge for a couple of years. And there we see that uh, it's actually maybe an opportunity to rethink the quality of those uh, developments in, in the coming years um, in terms of their human skill and their social life uh, aspects. So hopefully this will help, uh, uh, help us to think along uh, those lines uh, together. Um, so I, I would like to go through why is it important? We already touched on this a little bit in the polls. Why is it not happening by itself? There was a poll about that as well. What can we do to include placemaking and area development more? Uh, and to have a couple of cases from uh, our own uh, practice as well. Um, and then we would like to dive more into the criteria, the tools, um, because Area development, of course, is a system. And, and if you want change to come about, you need to think of the entire system. So we've uh, analyzed the different phases of the area development and are now thinking uh, per phase, what can you do? How, can, how should you change the criteria and how should you change the, the tools? And we'll end, of course, with a panel discussion and Q&A from the audience. So I hope you keep asking your questions so that we can feed the, the, the after my talk, feed the, the, the panel. Uh, and of course, we'll end with uh, the next steps after this uh, webinar. Now, a lot of our thinking comes from uh, the collection of books we've uh, we've made and are making on what we call the city at eye level. The city that you see and experience uh, around you when you're walking down the street as a pedestrian. And I think we all have that gut feeling of uh, turning a street that you really like, has a great character, and you instantly think, oh, I want to linger, I want to spend time here. And that gut feeling very often you have in the more historic uh, streets, of course. 
And what we would like to do is to take those criteria to find out what are the secrets and mechanisms behind those and bring them to the new uh, areas of our cities uh, more. So for instance, this is one of uh, historic uh, examples, of course, uh, in my own street in Amsterdam. And uh, it boils down for us to this man reading a book in front of his house um, because he's sitting there in, in kind of the, what we call the hybrid space between private to public. Um, and when we interviewed him, he told us that I bring this book but I, because I feel naked sitting here without the book. It feels like you're spying on people. But already when I sit down here, I actually know I'm hardly going to read the book because the neighbors pass by and you have a conversation with each other. And now we'd like to take this feeling from the more historic parts of our cities, uh, and we all have them around the world, right, and in Europe, to our new parts of the cities. And luckily, we see a lot of uh, good examples in, in, the, in the newly built. And there's more and more awareness of placemaking. We would say the networks are strengthening all across the world. But still, if we look at the majority of what's being built, um, we, we should be able to do more, uh, we feel. So why is it important? Um, well, first of all, uh, oh, I have a problem with my slides here. That's not good. Okay, um, I will just uh, uh, tell the story in the meantime and we can uh, share the slides uh, later on. First of all, public space uh, should be a backbone for the development of the, the area. Uh, we, we know from our studies that if public space is really the backbone, then the system as a whole will fun keep functioning more sustainably through the decades uh, of, uh, after development. Um, however, very often in, in uh, real estate development, everything is being planned and then what's being, uh, being left at the end of it is what we call public space. So that is kind of the reverse kind of thinking rather than putting public space in the plans first. Um, now I'm really struggling with my sheet here. So what I'm going to do is to open up this more. Um, oh dear, now I'm losing those. Okay, this is not good guys. Um, I will just uh, continue my story without uh, the showing the slides uh, then. Sorry for this. Um, so uh, the, the second uh, reason we see is that uh, it's not just about the, the, the value of the area development and the sustainability of it, but it's very much about uh, social aspects as well. We want to create a healthy city where people are invited to walk and, and cycle. We want to create uh, communities. We want to create child-friendly environments. We have uh, to address climate adaptation, and uh, that's where green uh, streets really uh, converse with the idea of placemaking. Uh, so there's a lot of social values that we are creating uh, together with uh, the, the, the more the, the, the property values. Ah, thank you for uh, showing the slides now. Um, and then uh, next to the social values, uh, we would say there's also uh, property value interests uh, here. This is a map uh, when we did a conference in, in Halifax with our friends there. Uh, I think TJ is listening in at the moment. Um, we got this map from one of the participants and he said, well, I've been making a map of which areas are the most valuable in the city. And then it turned out uh, that um, the, the most valuable parts are the, the ones with the highest human skill. Uh, so they are the ones that uh, uh, people apparently value the, the, the most. So if we can go to the next slide. Thank you, Nas, for jumping in. Um, uh, then we see, and this is a picture from Theo Soutener from Stadtkondraat, who is in the panel with us later, so he'll be much more eloquent about this, uh, that bringing life to areas actually creates a lot of uh, value for the property as well. It creates a lot of social value, but it creates property value, and not only on the short term, but also on the longer term. So just a case to, to showcase this is uh, Rotterdam Central District. Uh, this is uh, what is happening uh, in Rotterdam, right beside the central station, on, a, on your way to the most important square of the, of the city, in the, in the inner city. And you'd expect this to be a very vibrant uh, street, which of course, as you can see, it is not, because all the ground floors are uh, closed and blank walls. So what we're doing now, uh, on, you see that on the next slide, is that um, we are uh, studying uh, how can we open up those ground floors more and create better ground floors? Uh, but we're not only designing them, 
But we're also um, we're doing this in collaboration with Kuiper uh, Compions and the Vereniging Rotterdam Central District and uh, Stadkwadraat. Uh, but on the next slide, you, you would see that we're also calculating what is the business case of the of making this intervention. And there is a primary business case where you make the intervention to open up the buildings and you get the rent from the ground floor space units back. Um, in that business case, we cannot make it uh, financially. Uh, but there is a secondary business case where if you have vibrant uh, ground floors, you have uh, great, uh, great uh, liveliness in the area, uh, then the value of the, the property layers on top of the, uh, on top of the ground floor will go up in such a way uh, that you will only always earn this investment back. So there's a primary business case and there's a secondary business case when it comes to placemaking. So to conclude this little bit, yeah, the next slide, thank you. And this is a quote by Peter Smith, um, who is in the Placemaking X movement and is the CEO of Port Phillip in Melbourne in Australia. And he says, yeah, well, what do we do with placemaking? In placemaking, we're building a lot of different kinds of capital. We're building social capital, like the, the community uh, networks, we're building cultural capital, we're building economic capital, physical capital, and green capital. So placemaking is not only about creating great public spaces, it's about a lot more values than, than just that. So even in these times now, uh, when, we can, when it's harder to create the physical capital, we still very much need to carry on with uh, engaging in placemaking to keep building the social capital so that when we can all go out again, we will be able to build on that and turn that into physical capital. Yeah, next uh, part, please. So why is placemaking an area development not happening by itself? Well, we already tapped into this a little bit in the, in the polls. We see many, many reasons, and it's a very complex uh, systems, but just to highlight three of those, let's go to the first one. Um, so what we see, uh, and this, by the way, is a picture of, from Halifax. What we see is uh, human scale, a social life, uh, community, and sense of place very often come way too late in the development process. We plan a lot. Uh, we plan all the, the technical stuff, uh, and it is a very complicated thing to do. Uh, and very often the, the scope of the, the vibrance of the area only comes in uh, at the end of the process. So we want to start thinking about this earlier in the process. Second reason uh, that we see is that there's a lot of standardization going on right now in the construction uh, uh, world where you make uh, a lot of uh, prefabricated facades, uh, not on the site because we don't have the, the, the work hours are too costly nowadays. You make them somewhere else in a factory and then more or less glue them to the building. And what you tend to see is that you, you kind of see this, the same facades coming about everywhere. So this basically this picture could basically be everywhere. And the third reason, and that was already mentioned in the poll, uh, is that we see there are mechanisms in place where we see a lot of short-term profit, um, where for instance it's cheaper not to build an underground parking garage, as in this example, to have it on the ground floor, um, and then have these, these fences there, uh, which is cheaper on the short term, but in the long term, this is killing the public space for the next uh, 30, 40, 50 years when this building is standing there. Um, of course, we do see that uh, there's a lot of change going on in the thinking of real estate developers at the moment. So you could say, is this a blame game where we blame the designers that they shouldn't be, should be doing a better job or we blame the developers that they're too short-term oriented? We think that's too easy. We see a lot of change in all of these worlds. We think we see longer term thinking uh, in, in all of these worlds. So um, if we want to change the system, we need to tap into the logic of developers, the logic of investors, the logic of municipalities, the logic of designers. And then actually all of them, and this is why this middle circle is overlapping with the other circle, all of them can be placemakers. You can be working for a municipality and be a placemaker by the way you organize your area development, your, your frameworks. You can be working for a developer and be a placemaking by the way you do development. Uh, so that's what we feel we need more of. So let's go to the next part. What can we do to include placemaking more into the entire process of area development? I just wanted to give uh, the example, start with the example of uh, a great uh, presentation from Jennifer Kiesmaat for Toronto. 
she's always changing how, how rapidly our cities are, of course, developing. This is Toronto in 2006, and the next slide is 2016. So just see the abundance of development happening. And of course, this is happening in many cities across the world. Now, what they're trying to do is that they're trying to not um, be limited or not just do this in, as an aim in itself to, to create as many houses as possible, but to use the pressure on the city to help, uh, among others, to create a better public space. So on the next slide, we see a street as it was before. And now they use the pressure on developing to create a, actually a better public space uh, of this street, because this street is way too wide, it's, it doesn't have a lot of human scale. And then on the next slide, this is the same street. Uh, they use the densification to create better public space, to be more inclusive, to uh, be more uh, participatory in their processes. And in order to do so, on the next slide, they uh, first always, they, they say you can never just do an intervention uh, with a single building. We always need to think of the, the, the entire street first. And then uh, from that uh, view of the entire street, we zoom into uh, the building on the next slide. And there's lots of regulations for these buildings to make sure they contribute to a great sense of place and human scale on the street when it's been built. So that is one example. Another example is Beurskwartier Utrecht case that we've been uh, a part of as well, uh, where the city of Utrecht said we are going to build a whole new uh, area just next to this uh, central sta train station, so very central in the city. And we want the same feeling that we have in the, in the historic part of the city, which has a great human skill. We want that in our newly built part. So what they did in the next slide, they started to think from the public space networks first, and then from them designed uh, the building blocks. Um, and another example from this project, on the next slide, they uh, really thought about what are the active ground floors and what are the more peaceful and calm ground floors, the blue ones, and what are the, the anchor points in there. And then on the next slide, in the frameworks, this is what they hope it will be. So a very lively, vibrant, human-scaled area. In the next slide, we see a bit of their frameworks um, where uh, for instance, they said, well, let's not do just one block of development by one developer, by one designer, so that you get these boring standardized facades. Let's split the, the, the entire urban block up into smaller uh, development units that can have larger uh, elements in this, like this tower you're seeing, uh, but will also have uh, smaller uh, type developments so that you will get much more variation on the street, for instance. One of the the, the rules for uh, more human skills to have more variation in the in the street uh, scape. Another thing you're seeing is that the, the high rise has a step back so that the wind is broken uh, on the fourth floor uh, and is being diverted on the fourth floor and never really reaches the public space. And for people to be comfortable later on in the public space, it is very important to think about the climate, to think about the wind. So this also goes to show you need to start thinking about the human skill already very early in the development process because before you know it you have drawn and, and designed all the high-rise buildings and you forgot to think about the future quality of public space so let's uh, so what this means what we can take from these cases is that we need to think about a very integrated way three-dimensional way about public space not just the horizontal surface but also the facades of buildings and especially the ground floors the second big lesson we can take is that to create, it's not enough just to create create public spaces. Yeah, we, let's go to Maslow's pyramid. Um, so we don't only cater for the basic human needs, but we also want these spaces to be inspiring. Uh, so to get from space to place. And then the third uh, lesson we can take from this is that we see in, this, in these cases is that it's not just about uh, the hardware, not just about the design. It's very much about the software as well. Uh, the users and activities and the social life, but it's also very much about the orgware. I just saw in the polls that a lot of you said that the most difficult part is in the management phase. So we'll get back to that, but that's very much how do you organize uh, con the continuation of placemaking in the management phase and not only in the development phase. So two cases that tap into this. First case is Delft, three offers a transformation area uh, that is uh, an industrial area until now. And it's being redeveloped into a mixed use uh, area for uh, working and living. Um, 
and we were asked to help out. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide to think about. Yeah, but we need social amenities as well. We don't just only need houses. We don't only need job places, but we need social amenities as well. So uh, to think about the social amenities in this place. So we calculated um, what are the, how many doctors do you need? How many childcare centers? How many uh, spaces for the youth and for kids to play? Um, so let's integrate that into the planning process. The next step was, to really think through uh, the zoning, uh, what are going to be the more vibrant places, the yellow one, what are going to be the more peaceful places, the, the green one, because it can't be vibrant everywhere. And what are the places where you're going to do the, the loading and docking for the shops, for instance, and where the, the vans can stop in front of the, and that's the red one. So to have different zones of public spaces. And then the next one, um, is a, a second case. So this, the Delsky office, I think, is a case similar to Utrecht, where you already in the planning phase think through the, 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 the planning process from the point of view of human scale. Then in the implementation of and the development, the Club Rennhuizen is, is an example where we've organized an area cooperative. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, this is a transformation area with a, a lot of... Uh, ugly 80s office buildings that are largely were largely vacant but we're now slowly turning that into a mixed use area next slide and uh, we're doing this with a hundred different owners because uh, the area is very fragmented in its ownership next slide um, so in order to really bring about change we need uh, the real estate developers to work with the building owners with the businesses with the residents and with the social and creative in initiatives and with uh, the city council so uh, the area cooperative is really to do this in a very cooperative uh, way and, and uh, so we've started this cooperative as a joint organization for place making community building and etc and it will it leads to a lot of development in the meantime next to the slide and then it's important to think about the funding as well. And I, th I think in the panel, we will be able to go deeper into this, um, but we are thinking, always thinking through how can we uh, have these organizations to be financially independent um, and, and uh, let the development process pay for this. So we managed to come up with this funding model. In this case, the real estate developers need to pay an area fee. And a part of that area fee goes into the Club in, in into the budget so that we have an annual budget independently for the next 10 years to be able to do placemaking in the area. Next. And that was an inspiration recently to bring this, for instance, to Melbourne, to the largest uh, urban renewal area. Um, I just I was lucky enough before Corona to be able to go there and help the team out there and create a, a similar cooperative, but then for an area of 480 hectares and future 80,000 jobs and 80,000 residents. So let's go on because uh, we need to be aware of time. Uh, I just want to go through this very quickly uh, and, and show, and then I guess we can talk about it more in the discussion. So we just want to show that in the phases of real estate development, yeah, the next phase, please. Uh, you have the concept phase where you're developing the concept as a real estate developer uh, and you don't know whether you're going to be the one doing it. Then you're selected and you start developing a plan for an area. Then you go to more the design of the buildings, of the area, of the buildings and the public spaces. So you work it out. Then you get to the phase where you actually develop the area. And then after the development is being done and the, the houses are being rented out and the, and the office and etc., then comes the management phase. So what we're seeing for each of these stages, each of these phases, you need to apply the criteria of the city at eye level, of great places, of social life. So we won't have time to go through all of them bit by bit, but let's just skip through them in the concept phase, in the plan phase. Um, you want the blocks to be fine-grained, for instance, in the design phase. Let's go to the next one. You want this variation rather than to have big blocks. In the, uh, in the building uh, designs, you want to think about the wind, for instance, as we use the example, but also in the public space designs, um, we, you, you want to, uh, to think about the greenscape and etc. So in each of these stages, then comes the development, uh, and there's a, a, a criteria that you can use there, and also in the management phase. 
and then for each of these stages, we're also developing uh, the, what are the tools that we can use there. And uh, in each of the stages, there is a lot of tools that you can use. And that we've also started sharing on Placemaking Europe in the manuals. Uh, and we need to do much more. We are, we are aware of this. But, and for instance, we're also thinking this through with uh, AM, one of the largest real estate developers in the Netherlands currently. How can you use these tools in each stage of the development? So let's go through them very quickly. Um, so these are some of the tools in, in a bird's eye view. But then if we go to the next. So in the concept phase, uh, you can use a lot of tools that come from placemaking, such as a Jane's walk uh, in the next slide. Uh, you can place a caravan there and start uh, uh, getting to know the co community. Next slide. But you can also make maps of what is the quality of the public space. In this case, it's the Rotterdam Central District. Blue is terrible and cold, and red is nice and warm. And you can see in one uh, view, you can see the challenge of the area. Next one. Um, but then in the plan phase, you can start activating. Next one. Uh, so and you can do uh, start to engage the community more. You can start doing uh, workshops like uh, the place games we all like to do or in the next one. Yeah, just keep going, uh, Nas. Thank you. <laughs> the eye level game um, in the design phase. Um, you, uh, you need to maybe change the design more to the uh, eye level view as well. So we're using virtual reality with the designers to walk past our future buildings and with the municipal teams. But you can also start the activation, uh, like uh, getting a city beach as uh, they did here in Eiberg in Amsterdam or on the next slide or have a bar or the activation that we've been a part of in the Schaberg plan. These are temporary activations to start testing what works. And the hunk design uh, Nadine uh, in, the, in the beginning uh, presented, they uh, came up with the idea to bring the flying grass carpet to the Schaberg plan uh, as a kind of temporary activation to bring a softer surface. And now a lot of people are using the, the square actually. So we're learning that for, uh, something from that for the more permanent interventions. So I'm slowly coming to the end uh, of this talk. So in the management stage, it's very important to think about uh, how can we build an area cooperative or use a business improvement district or have a, a placemaking management uh, team on board uh, to, uh, to continue the process after the development because an area is never finished when the development uh, is uh, finished, the physical development, then you start to create the social structures and the economic structures in the area. And we see a lot of examples of those as well, like here in the business district of Amsterdam, where they appointed a ground floor activation manager to match between demand and supply. Next one. Or King's Cross is one of the famous examples. But we're also helping to create a new financial infrastructure for uh, placemakers to invest into the cities themselves, like we did here in the, in the province of Utrecht, uh, where this, on the next slide you will see uh, the Hof van Cartesius is a great initiative uh, by a placemaking, adding a lot of quality to the area that uh, only they would be able to do, uh, create an entire circular uh, area, circular development, and showcasing and bringing about quality of public space and sense of community as well. So um, more of these tools to be shared in, in Placemaking Europe uh, on the website and in our talks. And hopefully we can go more deeply into this in the, in the panel discussion from now on. Um, but I hope you got a hint of if you really want to uh, bring the idea of placemaking to the end, entire uh, development process, then you need to really go into the entire system, take all the stakeholders and go into the entire st all the stages of development and really think through uh, this uh, through a new from the very beginning. So I would leave it at that and, and thank you for now for this. I hope you will have lots of questions for the for the panel now. Thank you very much, Hans. I think it was quite insightful to see also how place making, let's say, the more community aspect relates also to the development one, which I think is a it's a very important um, aspect to start uh, developing further. Uh, now you can see me. Good. Okay, so thank you very much for that and thank you for keeping the time tracking as well, keeping that in mind. I very much appreciate it. So let's now open up a little bit for, uh, for reflection. 
for, for this reflection round, we have invited Ramon Marades, Milena Ivkovic, and Theo Statener uh, with very interesting positions, all of them, to reflect a little bit on what Hans has just said and also from their own experience. So first I would like uh, to ask Ramon Marades from Valencia, from La Marina de Valencia, to share with us his uh, experience and thoughts on place-led development. Thank you, Ramon. Hi, hello, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be to be here with you this afternoon and also with this this great group of attendees. Uh, and thank you all for your for your reflection on what's being doing done right and wrong in the like several examples examples of good and black practice and this great presentation by Hans. Just to warm up the debate a bit, I think like we are touching a point some elements that are really central of what we are trying to do in different parts of Europe through placemaking Europe. And I think a key element of this, it's actually like one of the core aims of placemaking Europe. It's, it's about how can we move the tactical into the strategic. So probably place-led place development is, is the answer. No, How can temporary interventions, how can the lighter, quicker, cheap experiments, cheaper experiments, can be on a service of uh, broader long-term goals. And how can we keep it people-oriented as well? No, Because there's been, I was checking some interesting questions at the Q&A section, when people is wondering to what extent it is place-making still when we are moving to place-led development or broader-scale development, and also other concerns with, which I find really legitimate about uh, which is the danger of using place-making as a green watch washing experience, like um, to, to, to dress up some kind of other developments that can have uh, bad consequences or, or non-intended uh, outcomes, not to use the place making and just make it nicer and that's it. And, and I think that's an answer that we all face. But basically, I think we I think we really can can scale up the principle scale of place making. And as soon as it's people led and it's with the people for the people, including them, then it's still place making. No, so we have to bear in mind it's not on, it's not about like making nice square using temporary interventions, put a couple of benches. It's about the core principles of that that are mainly related or uh, with the old war and software dimensions. So I, I think that's really, really relevant, especially at a moment like that. No? We'll see, we are seeing that different cities and different uh, contexts are using different approaches to lead to this current crisis. But generally, a lot of cities were going to open up uh, and implement some different solutions in public space. Uh, and that also gives us a very good example of place-led development, no? because we as placemakers are experts on the practical, so we can be really quick, uh, quick and fast to intervene in public space to make sure that we keep physical distance, maintaining social distance, we will reimagine culture and uses in public space, but I think it's very important to serve at the same time long-term long goals. And that's what place-led development shows, it also shows another thing that is very important, that there is a business case. So there is a business case of place making. We are increasing value. But at the same time, we, we should expand that and think about economic case as, as well, because it's not only about many properties have a higher value, but it's about inclusion. So relating as well to our book, our city, you know, it's about making making people, like allowing people to stay in the place they live. So I think we should now with this business development group start to move from property values to economic impact in the broader trends because we are talking about inclusion we are talking about jobs we are talking about the use of housing as well because we cannot deny which are the structural and implication of this thing no so we can make sure that there's a great place led development and we manage the play the, the space afterwards but as soon as housing this is still used in some parts of the world and in big capitals just to storage uh, money as a saving method and not a place uh, to live where we have entire blocks around the world where there are virtually not inhabitants no i was checking a very interesting examples at the Poblenou area in barcelona because we now in, in Spain, at 8 p.m. every day, we go to the, our balconies to clap, especially to thank uh, the service sector and the health, health workers that are working very hard for us. And there are entire blocks in the city where nobody's clapping. 
because there's nobody living there, no? So I think one of the key elements that we are facing in the following years, especially after COVID, but not necessarily because of COVID, is so for thinking about which are the economic fundamentals within city building. So that can mean non-place-led development to summarize if housing is used for storing money to saving money and not to living there, no? And that's, that's I think, it's one of the main challenges. So we're scaling up, as I said, moving from temporary to long-term, making sure that every short-term intervention is in a service of a long-term mission that has to be built, built with the same principles of placemaking which are the community bottom-up princi principles and so on. And yeah, now it's a great time to think about that. Thank you very much. You're very right. And um, exactly as you said, the strategy from the short term to the long term, and especially during this timing, I think it's uh, quite of critical importance. Thank you very much, Ramon, for sharing. Thank you. Thoughts. And I would like to invite uh, Milena Ivkovic from ISOCARP to share with us also her impression of, uh, about uh, place-led development. Thank you, Milena. Presentation and, um, you know, when we talk about placemaking <coughs> at our meetings and congresses and events that we organize with ISOCARP, you know, we actually uh, rarely talk about this place-led development. I have to say there is a lot of, let's say, theoretical talk about how placemaking is bringing value, or is it a social category, or is it an artistic category, but you really miss this kind of anchoring or embedding the placemaking really in the process of, of urban development. So I'm really uh, uh, happy to see uh, how this was explained in a very simple way, and still very um, uh, thoughtful how to, what placemaking means, let's say, for the, to increase the value, of course, of, uh, of, of the investment, but also to uh, uh, try to improve the lives of the citizens in a, in a, on a longer term. So that's, uh, uh, that's something that I think definitely will have a future in the, uh, uh, in the coming years to get even more developed and more, uh, how do you say that, a more independent financial models. And, I completely agree also with Hans and, and with other panelists who said like this is actually a, a kind of opportunity to think about those new and innovative models. Uh, we don't know exactly what is uh, uh, going to happen with cities after the, the, the crisis, but what we experience right now is definitely that the public space is suffering a lot with really. its public space is completely traumatized to uh, to cite uh, Vinita Shetty from uh, Placemaking India, you know, it's like, it's, I don't know how are we going to recover from this. Uh, but that's, uh, that, it, it should not stop us from being, you know, ambitious and develop all different kind of tools. And as some of you may know, uh, I'm very active in the uh, toolbox part of the Placemaking Europe, together with the Tool Test Day crew. Uh, and we are actually uh, performing all, all kinds of um, co-design and very rapid prototyping uh, placemaking tools. Because other part that is really missing in this placemaking story, when you talk about place-led development, of course, that's a, a missing link from the, let's say, from the ISOCAR point of view, from what we see that our members are missing as a piece of knowledge. But what is also really missing in connecting it better to the people is to try to really give them practical tools to keep on going with placemaking. You know, usually in a lot of processes, uh, citizens have been involved in the one of those steps in placemaking, whether it's at the beginning of the process, in the middle or in the end. Unfortunately, it's usually at the end when citizens are coming to say something. And they are involved in uh, expression or, of their ideas, expression of, let's say, some design sketches, recommendations, but really to how to embed people more into tending to public space, into maintaining it, and how to allow them to have more initiatives in public space. And um, there is also kind of, you know, uh, a gap in the knowledge on what can you do as a citizen with public space 
and contribute to the um, climate uh, adaptation and contribute to this and contribute to that to all different important aspects so i hope we are going to also go a bit deeper with, into that with our uh, tool test uh, day uh, workshops which are actually uh, aimed for uh, for the citizens to get some kind of hands-on uh, directions how to do it and actually that's uh, more or less my remark on the on the on the on the presentations so far thanks a lot again for organizing this thank you too milena for joining uh, i think <laughs> the work that you're already doing with the tool this day has also the aspect of the right to the city and the right to decision making and planning yes. our own cities to not only as a bottom-up but also where the bottom-up meets the top to down and i think that's very important in place making Yes, it, it so, is very important, and I actually I, I I'm going to refuse to talk about bottom up in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the future. You know, it's like it, it's just place making, you know, and making stuff. Yeah, but it's uh, it's yes, it's more or less about that really to uh, empower the people to be more influential. Exactly. Thank you very much for sharing. And Thank going you. From and also now I will invite one of our best friends, as we tend to say, uh, Theo who helps us a lot with, uh, for me at least, the awkward work with the numbers. Uh, Theo de Stadinger from Stad Vardat from, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, I think all presentations more or less had elements that have to do with also your work. So what is your take on uh, placemaking in area development? Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for the possibility to talk a bit about uh, uh, well, what I focus on, on the financials, also in the story of Hans. The financial organization and of course the added value of uh, placemaking and place-led uh, development and as you uh, saw the the questions and the answers uh, the, the the most important thing is how to do this in the management phase and that's because of a lot of things needs to be uh, uh, pointed out uh, in the phases before that uh, you uh, have to make seeds and uh, put the seeds in the starting phase to let it grow towards the develop, development phase and of course in the management phase and that's what uh, what uh, what 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 the problem is uh, how to uh, have place making also in the uh, in the management phase and i think it's very important that we show what the added value is in place making not only in financial aspects but economic and social and cultural uh, aspects and these things are all as hans also said interwoven into uh, uh, each other so we need to have the discussion with the real estate owners and the real estate developers about uh, how this value creation works and how it works out for them and how it works out for the people who are living in the area and what you see is that it in especially in the netherlands it comes together more and more there are more and more discussions about it and what we see also then is that a lot of people want to uh, invest or want to create uh, these places but therefore there are not people who are buying it or who can be able to finance it so we need to build the structures also uh, together and then we have to think about the long term of the organization and the financials with it uh, and then it is possible in the management phase to also uh, uh, have these organizations ready um, and grow to it uh, 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 together. So I think it's important that uh, uh, the financial aspects uh, are in the business case of the area um, and what uh, Ramon said is also very important. Not that uh, you can bring placemaking to the area and start making more uh, use of it and making more fun of it, but it's also very much important to focus on what the area wants to be on the longer term. And then you can start with placemaking with these economic activities or these social activities and start with it and grow from that uh, to the long, uh, to, uh, in the long term area. And because of that, uh, it's, it's less difficult then to uh, use also the investors and help them to invest in the small scale at the start and let it grow towards uh, 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 further on in the uh, in the area so uh, and what we see in uh, like Nieuwegein and the other areas as well is we need to start small but we need to start and we also need to build our own financial models uh, to uh, convince others 
and uh, not make it too big at the start, but make the possibility to let it grow. And start with a coalition of the willing. And from that on, we grow on uh, with people starting to share, starting to uh, be part of the organization, and it can grow on. And if it grows on, then you have a good fundament for the management phase as well um, to uh, uh, keep the placemaking and the programming and the place-led development, uh, not only in the starting phase, but also in the management phase. So that's what I wanted to uh, add to this. Thank you very much, Theo. Um, and I think this very much relates to the, like, the new level where placemaking is going. So I think this is also the future for us as experts, as uh, maybe even for the activistic world that's now working with placemaking more. So thank you very much for joining us and for uh, being part of this. Uh, I think there has been quite some discussion happening in the Q&A uh, box, right, Jeroen? Jeroen Laven from Steep on Placemaking Europe, the board, he was coordinating you in the discussion. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I feel like uh, I'm uh, the Eurovision Song Festival person, so it's good that somebody is making up for that. Uh, no, I've, I followed the discussion in the Q&A and in the chat box and in the app group. It's, it's great for, thank you all for the, for the participation. Uh, just to give a little bit back as an answer, as maybe also uh, a next step in, in, the, in the talks between all of us. Uh, I think the leading theme that I noticed in the discussion is the, the theme of friction. And so the friction between pressure on the city, pressure on public space, the, the friction on uh, pressure on, on the big budgets versus the smaller budgets, the friction between the roles of the developers, the city, uh, the, the, the community. Uh, so I think I'd like to invite you to elaborate a little bit more on keeping the, you know, dealing with the friction. And maybe also, uh, uh, if you have an, uh, an idea, uh, how do you think this friction is going to change in the times to come? So let me start with uh, Hans. Yeah, so one of the, the questions I think was, uh, how can you combine uh, pressure on cities with public spaces? Because the higher the density, the less public space you may have. Um, so I, I think this is a, a, exactly the point where you see these frictions um, and overdevelopment and uh, higher, higher prices. So what we notice in a lot of our projects is that we are trying to rethink this and trying to find new answers, trying to find uh, answers on, for instance, how to be more inclusive in not only the, the, the housing types that you embrace in the, in the area development, but also on the ground floor users and the economic spaces. So in housing, you may say that a, a certain percentage of the future houses should be affordable. We're now also saying that a certain percentage of the ground floor spaces should be affordable, available for startups, because they will bring something, local for, uh, formulas and et cetera, because they will bring something else to the area than just the, the, the normal, uh, uh, the, the bigger firms. Now, if you want that to happen, you really need to think through this uh, already in a very early stage of the development because you need to make different financial arrangements and you need to uh, bring an organization about to, to manage that. So this is where thinking about finance with people like Theo comes in, uh, rethinking those, uh, those, uh, those structures, but also to, to uh, rethink the, the way you organize that in a way that you uh, not only do this in the first part of the development, but you may be able to keep being inclusive in the, in the management uh, stage. So we, we see these frictions, but we also like to address them in new practical ways at the same time, I think. And, and we're struggling, right? Because we're trying to, to, to discover these answers. So I hope we get much more input on this. Maybe I can invite one of the other speakers to reflect a bit from their own practice on the, on the friction. Who would like to go? Peter. Uh, yeah, it, it's an um, interesting topic to start with um, because like lots of countries uh, around the world, we're struggling with um, coronavirus in the UK. And um, I don't know if you, you saw in the press, but um, we, we've got a huge shortage of ventilators. And uh, the people who've come to our rescue are um, Formula One um, teams. Um, which on one level is really encouraging and on another level you do wonder why the organization charged with our national health 
is unable to produce ventilators and um, a company that sends cars in uh, circular movements around tracks is hugely competent and hugely well resourced to do things. So it feels as if we're at a seminal moment where the market allocation of resources is being shown as um, short of the social contract we need. And I think that, um, for me anyway, I hope the analogy works for others, but I, I, I think that, that analogy works for me in, in, in where we are. We need a, a major shift in the way that we are um, approaching the development and the financing of our places. The balance is wrong. And as practitioners, you know, we're so busy doing our tactical interventions. I think the, the point that Ramon was, was making is that it's almost easy to kind of swat us off, really, and keep us doing rather trivial sometimes, ephemeral things. Um, at least they're portrayed as such. I don't think their impact is as such, but we're in danger of them being portrayed as such. So as a movement, we need to have a concerted attempt to really ask those kind of big questions, I think, um, really tackle those tensions head on. And we've got plenty of credentials, plenty of track record and things to bring to that argument. But I think we're struggling to make that argument coherently at, at, at the kind of at top tables, if, if I can put it that way. Thank you, Peter. Um, Ramon, uh, you've been, can you elaborate a little bit about how you face the challenges in, in La Marina and maybe also reflect on, on uh, your, your starting this talk about the post-corona times, how, how placemaking is how cities are influenced by that and what's the role of placemaking. What could you say about that? Sorry, is it okay now? Yeah, yeah though, <laughs> broad topics, both of them. Uh, dealing about frictions, I think the first thing is acknowledging that whatever we do has an, ev an even impact, an unbalanced impact. So we cannot assume that doing like a better public space, doing some housing, is going to make everyone better at the same level. So everything that we do has an even impact, which is kind of the key element of urban policy. And also we have acknowledged that if we decide to put a bench over here or opening and start a ground floor over there, it will have effects on the on accessibility to certain issues, on housing prices and so on. And that's very important to acknowledge that from the beginning. And actually developing, doing the, the, the transformation of La Marina de Valencia, that's one of, one of the elements, because most of you are familiar, luckily enough, with the case, and most of you have, have been there at Valencia. But you see that a waterfront or any key element or central or important urban area in, in the city, there are a lot, a lot of preference around it. No? And there would be the people from the boat industry that would say, okay, that's a marina, we only want boat there. Or the people from the leisure industry would say, okay, let's make clubs and restaurants and that's it. And the startups only want technology and the, and the, and the, and the smart city guys get really excited about sensors. And do, well, we have to manage those preferences that are not aligned and generally are not aligned. And like answering with that question, like in the, in the, in the Q&A section, I came with kind of a, a D3 answer to that, which I said we, we could be the same dialogue and data. No, it's very important to bring data on the table in an honest way, to try to explain which will be the impact of things relating to the, to the, to, to the job creation, related to the amount of public space that we are recovering, related to the diminishing of, of toxic emissions, this kind of things. Also design, it's important. And there is one thing that maybe I personally failed in kind of a placemaker trajectory because... Orward, we all know that orward and software are probably the key elements, but they are really difficult to explain. It's very difficult to explain a process. And people really want to have an idea about how the things will look afterwards. And it's not necessary to do a rendering, because I'm not a big fan of rendering, but maybe show another example showing how it will look. No? And in the case of taking cars out of the street and making it more people friendly, it's really easy to, to show. And also a really honest dialogue, because there is not a, a perfect outcome for everyone at the same time. And when we do big scale transformations, we need people 
to commit and we need people to accept that the outcome is not the only the side but it's a combination of the sides but it needs a really honest dialogue so i think like the sank dialogue and data help us to 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 overcome those frictions but also we have to admit that we are never done and there is always room to improve and it's the same like happens to, to with inclusion that it's a never-ending goal i think please late like development it's a never-ending goal because we need to manage it, we need to keep improving it, we need to keep the vibe, we need to be keep uh, open enough during the management to, to make it uh, nicer and active and so on. There's one thing about how, where are we doing it at La Marina de Valencia, and then just briefly about post-coronavirus, because through Placemaking Europe, it, we, we were sharing that in our last newsletter, we are really... Uh, we, we want to have a say as well about how cities and how places will, la will look after the virus in kind of two stages. No? So we, as I said at the beginning, we are experts on temporary interventions. We, do, we know how to do lighter, quicker, cheaper uh, interventions to help play places uh, like to, to, to design places. And that will be extremely relevant for the kind of intermediate phase that now the coronavirus will show that after we went through the war thing, that would be a, re a long, a long like time, maybe two, three, six months, where we cannot go back to normal in terms of using in a really intense public space. But we will still to make downtown alive. We need to reopen small shops as soon as possible. We need to take care of the right. We be. be like we need to be in public space and breath fresh air and do sport and so on. So then we have a lot to say about how to do that. But then especially long term, how does it mean for downtowns? How does it mean? What does it mean for the future of work? What does it mean? Uh, um, what does it mean for how, how we manage cities? So we just, so far we launched a hashtag, which is places after uh, COVID. And we are collecting some ideas and some examples. And the idea is to write, together a manifesto that will be published in different European languages because we are also a European network and we also are aware about how weak the answer from the European level is, is, is it is nowadays and we hope to also have a, have a transnational answer to that because obviously the main thing that we learn within this crisis is that we are not isolated. Thank you, Ramon. And we can be. Very important topic. Uh, one of the questions that also popped up a lot is about keeping the community involved, huh? giving the community the right place in this discussion where it's easy to get lost in the, in, in the big world of developers and of, of municipalities. Uh, also with the post-corona situation hopefully coming up, that's going to be also new challenges in, involved there. Uh, I'd like uh, to ask uh, Nadina Milena, maybe uh, how you look at this uh, subject. Uh, uh, Milena, you want to start? You have to it's unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have to unmute. Just yeah. a second. I'm Word. unmuted. Okay, good. Uh, I will start again uh, with, uh, uh, yeah, how do you keep uh, communities involved uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID? You know? <laughs> uh, generally, keeping communities in involved is also involving, in a way, you know. it's It's been, uh, when I started with placemaking activities or making place games like five years ago there was one setting when those games were uh, used for placemaking purposes now five five years after it's completely different scene uh, that needs to be uh, catered for in terms of uh, uh, community involvement the tools are changing very much they're becoming much more and much more digitalized if you cannot keep uh, community involved on a kind of digital level and just keep on trying to do uh, physical uh, small workshops. It's not going to, to, to be enough anymore. Uh, especially the, the, the smaller workshops are also very limited in a way. It's just a test. It's just a prototype. You still need uh, professionals to continue. You still need a municipality to be willing to continue and to uh, answer to all the questions and ideas that have been uh, produced during such a workshop. So, there is also a kind of shift and change in how do we keep community involved. And it's very interesting because now with this, uh, with, with this crisis and what is going to happen after the crisis, it's also quite, uh, uh, quite stimulating. The, 
if I see what happened in my street here in Rotterdam after uh, uh, one week already or some, some kind of isolation, I mean, the street was completely covered in, in, in paintings of children and it's, you know, there is no traffic or very, very little traffic. So it's one big party and everyone is, you know, doing beautiful stuff with the street. Now you see that the enthusiasm is already going down a little bit. You know, the, cr the crisis is going too long and the restrictions in the, in the public space are still not very clear or some people are not really using it or you can't have big groups in the, in the public space. So I think we need to somehow uh, take into that, that into account that involving the, the, uh, the community needs to change and we need to evolve, involve our methods and our tools as well. To, because the, you know, the, the, I had, a, and, and last year I had a presentation for the Vereniging Delta Metropole. They wanted to know a bit more about uh, communication tools. And the burning issue still is, how do you motivate people to dedicate their time for placemaking actions? Now everyone has time, so you know we can do things in uh, even with limited physical uh, presence. But when people uh, work, when they tend to their families, when they, I mean, who is going to participate then in the street life, you know, or making the street? So that's a very important component, the component of time and keeping pe people motivated, because usually there is just a small group of people who has time or has some other motives to participate, but they're not representative for the neighborhood you want to upgrade or the public space you want to upgrade to. So how to keep different stakeholders motivated is very, very important. And I truly believe in um, uh, bigger involvement of, of digital tools. Uh, I know that uh, uh, some of my colleagues are really criticizing, saying, oh no, you're going to the dark side, to the smart city side and mobile phone side. No, it's really, honestly, it's really a great tool. And <laughs> I think we should, <laughs> we should try to develop more on that, um, on that uh, topic. Okay. Thank you a lot. Maybe very last, very short, uh, Nadine, because you do a lot of work in public space with communities. How does it influence your work? But you have to unmute first. See, unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Very okay. Yeah. Um, 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 I like to uh, start with the following that I, um, I strongly believe that uh, people have a huge hunger to connect with each other and or that's normally what happens in street life and um, now that this is limited and we have in Holland we have the one and a half meter uh, social distance space um, you see immediately a lot of uh, inventiveness uh, within with people so people invent stuff how to how they still can um, um, connect with each other. Uh, you also see the little bears in the windows, uh, the child messages, or the clapping. Um, so I'm not that pessimistic about it. You just have to find a new way to uh, create uh, a public space that um, suits uh, the current situation. And we're only in this for a few weeks, and. Um, uh, I don't think that um, it, it stays this way. Um, we will come up with solutions. It, this is why we are creative people. And um, so, um, yeah, you see people sitting in front of the houses uh, now. Um, I didn't see the, uh, them doing that as much as, uh, as they do it now. Thanks. Thank you, Nadine. That's good to... Uh end the, the round of questions with the optimistic note. So thank you for that. Thank you all the panelists. And uh, to, uh, thank you all people sending in questions. And to, to wind up this uh, webinar, I give the floor to Vivian. Just uh, want to say, sorry Vivian, very quickly, mm -hmm. I felt very bad about my slides going bad, of course, it's kind of uh, your nightmare in, a, in a, a webinar like this, but I did share in the chat box a download link for everybody to uh, download the slides and please use them. And please comment on them as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you, Hans. And we will also be sharing both the recording of the video and the slides on our Facebook page and probably on our website as well. So you will all have access to the to the, to the material of the webinar. So thank every one of you. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here, like really present and sharing with us. Um, First of all, I would like to share some final moments that uh, we have developed a questionnaire with Placemaking Europe. 
that uh, we invite all of you to respond. It has to do with place-led development. It, it helps us to crowdsource knowledge, your, your context and your practice as well. So if you have some time, please do fill it in now. It will help us a lot. And of course, the results afterwards will be shared uh, open source uh, with everyone. Uh, and we also, I would also like to invite you to the coming up events that we have scheduled, virtual mostly. Uh, we have a screening of the movie Ecumenopolis on April 14th at uh, 7 o'clock Central European time. And we also have the Earth Week challenge coming up the week ahead. Uh, so please find those events on Facebook and probably uh, maybe Jeroen or someone can share the links if you cannot, or you can find them on slides afterwards when we share them. Sorry about that. And some hope for a physical meeting as well. Uh, from the project of Play City happening in Vienna in fall about place-led development with the community. More news about it coming up in our channels and some invitations on our site to join our place-led development working group as Place Making Europe we, we function on a working group so please join the place-led development group if you want to take action with us towards this topic subscribe to our newsletter, join our Facebook community, which is our main channel for communicating. It's amazing what you can find every day over there and what knowledge you can also receive uh, and ask for in this uh, group. And of course, our website where you can find all the tools that we are developing, uh, news about our uh, events and practices that we do. And I don't know, Jeroen or Hans, am I forgetting something? Except for thanks. Oh, I don't think so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Stay up to date, take care of yourself and your dear ones. And yeah, let's keep active in this. I think we have beautiful moments to share regardless of the situation. And thank you to all the panelists and participants.